Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Gina Coleridge. She is the founder of Hemp Biz Magazine. She's also working with the folks at the Cannabis Collaborative Conference. We're happy to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you for asking me. In fact, I just told you kind of offline that I was looking at Hemp Biz Magazine. I saw that you had a banking column. I need a banker because I'm on the panel for the Cannabis Collaborative Conference in Portland. So I have a lawyer, accountant, and banker. So I saw this, that um, there is a, a bank at the state capitol. So I called them up, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, Gina, and, and Hemp Biz Magazine. Well, um, Oh gosh, I don't even know where to start. I basically have been for 20 the last 23 years of my life, I worked for a two weekly newspaper selling advertising. And um just got kind of burnt out on that and the hint that the cannabis industry all of a sudden became legal and I thought, well, I could start a magazine in talking about this new industry. So I approached my boss of 23 years. I drug him actually to Vegas to MJ Biz mm-hmm. in 2015 and um, said, come on, let's, let's start this up. So him and I threw some money in a pot and, and opened our, put out our first issue in April of 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually just put my last issue out here about um, a month ago, three weeks ago. Um, I kind of had to start making some, a paycheck and um, financial reasons and different things. Um, So I don't have my magazine going anymore, but I'm still involved in the industry with Mary Lou. And I'm looking for other avenues in this industry to basically keep my hands in it because I think the hemp industry is going to be the biggest industry in the country in the next five to 10 years. And so you may end up taking this Hemp Biz Magazine digital. So if anyone's interested in uh, working with you, they can reach you at Gina K at HempBizMagazine.com. Uh, yes. Hopefully that'll drum up some, some interest to keep, kind of keep this magazine alive, at least digitally. I think so too. I would love to do that. So if anyone out there is interested in coming on board and helping me keep it going, at least digitally, I would love to hear from you. At least <laughs> reach out to me. I appreciate you telling your story, though, because it's not all about success. I mean, a lot of stuff we see on social media is not real. And so it's really easy to kind of tell people how great you are and how things are going. But the revenue aspect of it, are you really generating money? You could look at Dope Magazine as a perfect example. Um, David Tran sold Dope Magazine two high times for $13 million total. Um, 11 million in stock. That stock is worth nothing right now. Nothing. Yeah, exactly. He lost everything. He had $2 million worth of debt paid off and then got some shares. And those shares are worth nothing because High Times just wrote a letter to their investors saying, if we don't go public, we're uh, we're not going to remain a going concern, meaning going out of business. And David Tran just laid off, fired everybody that worked for him, no brick and mortar anymore. And that might end up happening at high times as well. So it's, it's a cutthroat industry. And it, this it is. isn't anything unique to cannabis or hemp. I mean, the magazine industry is cutthroat in general. It is. It is. And I went in, um, like I said, I'd never started anything in my life. And I, I thought it was going to be a lot easier. I'm a really good salesperson and I'm very tenacious. So I just thought it would be, but it's not it's not easy. It's just nothing worth fighting for, though, is easy, they say. So Um, but I would love to, like I said, still keep it going digitally. And, um, so if anyone has an interest out there, please, like I said, reach out to me. That would be amazing. I think this is, I think the hemp industry is just right now. It's got a lot of issues, um, because so many growers, so many farmers failed this year. They say that probably 50 to 70% of the farmers just in the state of Oregon failed this year, their, their crops. Mm-hmm. So we got to change that. We have to find ways to change that. And I want to help in that part of things. I want to figure out, bring people together that can help change the, and make it so that it, everybody is lucrative and making money and being successful in this industry. 
Yeah, there's a lot to learn. I mean, there's a lawsuit in Oregon for just seeds, the improper seeds being sold to where uh, that either weren't feminized uh, or it was just the wrong seed for the wrong climate for the wrong latitude. Um, yep. Mike West of Embark uh, had moved to Canada because it's easier to manufacture hemp and sell it to the American market being in Canada. So he moved out of the country to do that. And when I spoke to Mike West uh, about his business, he mentioned something very fascinating to me, which is that he found seeds grow at certain latitudes and there's, you know, these, these various um, uh, strains or cultivars that will not be, be the perfect fit for the Northwest and likewise Florida. So anybody who thinks they're just going to go into Florida and not get mildew, you just don't see anything out of citrus being grown there. They're not, exactly. they're not growing everything in Florida or Oklahoma, uh, which is going to be a nightmare similar to Oregon when they go uh, in the, in the recreational market. And so it's, and people do think that CBD is going to be around and, and you have to look at other more rare cannabinoids that have a higher margin. So a lot of the yep. CBD being pulled out of the ground with hemp in California at 600,000 pounds is going to crash that market. And there's a lot of people who came on board um, and with regulations like California not allowing CBD drinks, Washington just did that just a couple of days after hemp fest when literally companies were going there to launch their CBD brands and then boom, Washington said, nope, can't do it. So Can't do it. it's yeah. hard to survive with regulations. It's hard to survive without a huge amount of money. And then the magazine industry is, is just brutal. Yeah. A lot of consolidation. <laughs> yep. That's for sure. That is for sure. And I, I just talked to a gentleman the other day from Oregon, um, actually grows hemp. And he was telling me that, that 70% or more of the hemp that's growing right hemp and cannabis that's being grown in Oregon right now is all moldy. Mm -hmm. It's got, it's got, it's cause they don't test for mold in Oregon. So they can, they can sell it. They can produce it. They can put it on the shelves and they can market it. And it's got, and it's moldy. He said, that's part of the reason why they've got respiratory issues with people in Oregon right now that are smoking is because there's mold in the stuff that they're smoking. Yeah, if you put it in a pre-roll, you can't see it. And I know a lot oh. of farmers who didn't get a drying room until the very last minute. And so they were stuck. And so if you don't dry it and it molds and you still try to, uh, you know, have a product after that, whether you extract it or not, some of those mold spores are going to come right along with you. Exactly. Exactly. He actually told me, he said he would not buy one product out of Oregon right now, whether it was cannabis or CBD products that was grown in Oregon. He says, I wouldn't buy it. And I says, you grow in Oregon. He goes, well, I'd buy my stuff. He goes, cause I know I don't have mold in my stuff. Mm -hmm. He said, but I know he says, I've done my, my due diligence and I've gone around the state and he says, there's just so much that's out there. That's just moldy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there no, are some people know that. Um, but I don't think I'd buy anything from Oregon either right now, <laughs> knowing that. Right. Washington does test for mold, which is awesome that we do, and, and pesticides. I think we test for both, don't we? There's um, volunteer programs that will test for everything uh, called the OK program in Washington, and they're, they're finding a lot of stuff. They're finding heavy metals and, and mold and all kinds of things that are, that are sliding right through the system. Um, and so I stick to medical. I have a trusted person that I buy my medical uh, $500 pounds from, and I don't have to worry about all of that stuff because I know he's organic. So I really, the last two years since October, I guess of, um, was it 2018, 2017, time flies, mm -hmm. um, when we had five infused and five non-infused pre-rolls all pop for mold as well as cartridges that had Eagle 20 wow. and herbicide that causes cancer. It's carcinogen when it, when it burns. And then all of the hardware issues with vaping too, that leaches heavy metals. Like I'm good. I'm good with all that. I'm going to roll my blunts. I know it's tobacco. It's my guilty pleasure, whatever. Uh, I'd rather just stick with that until this uh, industry kind of professionalizes and normalizes a little bit more. Yeah. My trusted, trusted source. Exactly. <laughs> the exactly. I, I do the same thing. I, I get my, I get my flower from a friend that grows in his house, in his home. And, um, and so, yeah, um, it's just safer if you know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's mold to gold, uh, this whole saying. I know a couple of people in the industry, they're really, really good at what they do and they're confident that they can take moldy product and, and produce a, a quality extract from that. <clears throat> I don't know if I really want to do that. Um, I'd rather it just not even be an issue. Yeah. Uh, so a, a peace of mind doesn't settle well with me knowing that they're doing that. So I, I don't know. Time will tell if that's safe or not. Exactly. Exactly. I it 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 I think that the the regulations and things are going to change and it's going to have to change. It's just like I asked someone here um, a while back. You know why? As far as I know, the the food and the food department, the health department, I guess I should say, that goes around and and goes into restaurants to test to see if they are clean and and you know, says, okay, you're going to be checked down because you're, a, you know, you're not cleaning up or whatever. Um, they score them. There's none of that going on in any of the edible places that we are making edibles from. And I don't understand that. Why are they not under the same regulations? They're producing food that we're eating and putting in our bodies. You know, that, that to me needs to change that the, if you're making edibles out of THC or CBD, you should be under the same ruling as somebody that's working in a restaurant, um, you know, serving you food. Yeah, CBD is just another ingredient like flour. Absolutely. Yeah. You've seen a lot. I mean, having with this, <clears throat> having done this magazine and, and being involved in the industry as long as you have, uh, you've definitely seen a lot. So I'd like to kind of maybe shift gears and talk about your experience as it pertains to the future. So it's uh, about the end of the year. Next week is is Christmas already and ho uh, New Year's Eve is after that. So with your crystal ball prediction, based on your experience, are there trends that you've seen that are going to shift or continue or something out of the blue? Either way, what does your crystal ball say for the future of hemp and cannabis? Okay, well, what I see right now is a huge bottleneck in the industry because we had so many people through in every state start growing hemp. A lot of them thought, oh, it's just, you know, I can, I, I've been a farmer all my life, I can grow hemp, and they didn't know what they were doing. That I think needs to change. We need to educate people on how to be successful and how to actually grow hemp. And like you were saying with the seeds, we have to have the right seeds for the right climate to grow it properly. Mm -hmm. um, but the huge problem right now is there's no processing plants. There's no place, once these, thousands and thousands of acres of hemp we get pulled out of the ground who's going to process it because right now there's so few processing plants that can process it and i and i think that everybody went into it with this, the whole idea that we could all grow for cbd well that like you just said that's going to flood the market everybody's going to you know it's good the, the bottom's going to drop out so we have to figure out the other things that can be done with the hemp plant. There's 20, they say there's 25,000 different things you can do with a hemp plant. And we need to start investigating and looking into those things that, that are out there. I talked to a gentleman here about six months ago at an event in Portland, and he was from the UK. And him and his family grew grow hemp in the UK. And they have figured out a way through water and electricity to make hemp fibers as soft as cotton fibers that could literally be ran through a cotton mill. That He's trying to bring that technology to the United States right now. I am trying to hook him up with different people that have the to have a facility that he could do this here in the United States. Those are the kind of things that we need to be looking at. I talked to another gentleman that um, had hooked up with a company in one of the states back east, and I'm not sure which one. It's a, it's a state that has more paper. Uh, produces more paper than any other state in the United States, and they have tons of paper mills mm -hmm. that are cl now closed down one of these paper mills is opening back up and they have McDonald's is looking at using the, cause they're going to basically make paper out of hemp or products out of hemp through this paper mill. And McDonald's is looking at them to make their, 
their paper, their wrappings, their, their boxes for their hamburgers, their wrappings for their hamburgers That's out right. of hemp. That would be amazing. Think because they the paper will biodegrade. Everything made out of hemp is going to biodegrade. So it's, think of the stuff you're going to save that's getting thrown in our oceans and things like that. Um, that's where I'm hoping to see my crystal ball sees things going that direction in this industry. And we have to start looking at all the things that we can do with the hemp plant, not just extracting CBDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right behind me is uh, some paper here that I made with um, you know, biomass from hemp as well as coffee. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the coffee process, but being in the Northwest, we have a lot of waste that's associated with coffee. So when working with CBD um, and THC <clears throat> um, as, a, as an ingredient for some of these cold brew coffee companies, uh, I noticed that chaff was just being thrown away. So chaff is this um, shell on the bean. So when you have a green raw coffee bean roasted, uh, the shell pops off. And so yeah. that chaff is, is just like biomass. And so I took 40% chaff and 60% hemp and then made um, these packages. So you can have coffee truffles or just, you know, this, this paper here. Uh, is made from coffee and uh, and hemp as well, and so awesome. you can put coffee terpenes in here. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff. So what I'd like to see is um, is to make some limbs, you know, for for children who uh, have you know lost an arm or leg, whatever, and we can easily three D print uh, some a new arm made out of coffee and hemp. And so that's absolutely what I'd like to get involved with uh, this next year. Starting with coffee logs, we're going to make some molds and then sell coffee logs and then work our way up. That's awesome. That is amazing. I, I love that idea. <laughs> How did well, you yeah, it's just right off of what you said. So I mean, it's, it's, it is a good idea to take this stuff and, and make artificial limbs um, or yeah. paper or car parts or whatever. There's opportunities in it and biomass shouldn't be put into a landfill or just left to rot. There's a exactly. lot of things you can do. There's a huge amount of push for mushrooms as well. And this biomass is a perfect substrate for mushrooms. And so that's another thing I want to do is, is use it to start uh, mushrooms. You can give it to restaurants or, you know, just enthusiasts and rather than throw it away and let it mold, you can just inoculate it with some, some mushrooms and, and the spores and let it do its thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. I know that there's just so much, this gentleman that I met from the UK says that their process basically uses oh, like like a millimeter of water compared to what it takes to make cotton because cotton uses a lot of water mm. and, and, and the water is, cannot be reused, but the water in his site so that he uses can be reused. So um, it, it was just an, it, the way it was just an amazing thing when I listening to him talk about this process of taking hemp fibers and making them, as soft as cotton. And then he told me, I told him that I had just read a story about Levi Strauss and how they were basically claiming that they would have, that they would have clothing out within the next five years that would be completely made from hemp, not any cotton at all, completely made from hemp. And he looked at me and he says, where did you read that at? And he, and then I, I says, I don't, I read it online, I think. And he says, oh, he says, well, I'm working with some pretty big companies, which led me to believe that, he, his, his home, his family was working with Levi Strauss. He couldn't, he says, I can't tell you who, but he says, I'm working with some pretty big companies. Mm -hmm. So pretty amazing things that are out there and that are coming, that can be done with this plant. It's, it's, it's crazy that we had it illegal for the last, how many ever years, mm -hmm. 50, 60, 70 years or whatever it's been. It's crazy. Yeah, but you mentioned that you kind of got started 2015 at MJ BizCon. I just got back. Um, <clears throat> I think my immune system is still there. <laughs> but I was managing a booth at 420 Wholesale Pack with Jason Lammers, and he's got a really neat product, which is a dube tube, a joint tube made from 100% recycled materials. 
And so cool. that's going to be a first of its kind. It's going to be made locally. It's going to be cheaper than China and made from 100% recycled materials. So definitely looking forward to the future and what new products, new things are, are going to be uh, launched. Is there anything personally that you'd like to see aside from just crystal ball predictions, anything that um, you have bias on that you would like to see? I would like to see plastic bottles go away. <laughs> I would like to see hemp replace everything that's plastic in this country. That's my biggest thing. To know that we have, we, in our oceans, we have so much plastic that it's bigger than the state of Texas floating around is just sickening to me. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be something that's got, that right there to me has got to change. And that's what I would like to, that's my one big um, push is to try to, figure out how to use hemp to replace the plastics that we have in this country because hemp will biodegrade and we won't have to worry about it filling up our oceans. Yeah, find your local lobbyist group. Uh, ours here is called the Cannabis Alliance and Jason Lammers, who I mentioned with the recycled dube tube from 420 Wholesale Pack is the chairman uh, on the committee for packaging and waste. So he goes down to Olympia, the state capital, and was able to reduce the amount of packaging by half. I think it was a four millimeter and he got reduced to two. Uh, and so that's a lot less waste. Now he's moving forward with the recycled dube tubes. So yeah, find a, a, find a lobbyist group, find somebody like the Cannabis Alliance uh, where you can go and you can be a part of it and and get things done because it really can happen i'm on a lobbyist group on the same cannabis alliance and that's to overturn a felony on the consumption lounges in washington state which is a class c felony to maintain and operate a marijuana lounge um, which has been a long time five years you know i was a subcommittee member first now i'm the chair of it five years later and awesome. uh, we're making some headway. So I've, I've written a bill. I studied eight different states on their cafes, marijuana lounges, whatever you want, tasting rooms. Um, and so it's just kind of taking all of the good parts and throwing it together and making it work is just kind of being active in, in, your, in your area and not just sitting back and waiting for somebody else to do it. So whether that's recycled or, or a cafe or otherwise, get yep. involved. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, if somebody wants to get involved, you know, if they want to see Hemp Biz Magazine remain digital and not not go to the wayside, if somebody wants to, you know, get involved in the industry, how can they get a hold of you? Well, they can reach out to me, like you said, through my email, which is Gina, G-I-N-A-K, at Hemp Biz, with a Z, magazine.com. Um, uh, they can also reach, uh, I'm on, I have a Facebook, I have an Instagram, I can be reached on e either one of those. Um, I don't know if I want to put my phone number out there. Should I put my phone number out there? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And me and you, we'll, we'll wrap again next month uh, down in Portland. I'm a moderator at the Cannabis Collaborative Conference. I'm going to be doing a cannabis lab with a lawyer, accountant, and banker talking about everything that is hemp and cannabis and CBD and everything else um, yep. into the new year and how to survive and thrive. So you have to come to that event, check it out. Um, but with that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Gina of Hemp Biz Magazine. Appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you so much for asking me. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you in Portland next month. Absolutely. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. By the way, if you enjoy the content, please show your support with the cushy gesture of $4.20 a month on the Talking Hedges Patreon page. This will kind of help you spread the word. I've been asked to speak all over the world uh, from Toronto and Colombia, Spain, um, Miami, all over, Tokyo. But your support's important to me. I haven't monetized the podcast. I want to be as authentic and transparent as possible. I want to avoid conflicts of interest uh, or even the perception of paid opinions. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or pay me on the Talking Hedges Patreon page or don't and I'm out.